Hi, this is Smart Drivers talking to you tonight about smarter defensive driving skills, techniques, and abilities you need to make yourself a safer, smarter driver and significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. Smarter defensive driving, minimum safe distance, and that's what we're talking about. What is the minimum safe distance between you and other vehicles and road users? on the roadway and what is that minimum three feet one meter between you and pedestrians please and more if you can do so uh, motorcycles uh, safe following distance three to four seconds and of course uh, i put a question up there a couple of weeks ago on the community tab lots of debate about how, what is a safe following distance three three seconds is a safe following distance and the reason we measure in time is due to the fact that it is relative that as your speed changes, so too does the distance between you and vehicles in front. Let's not make it complicated. Uh, and really, if you want to boil it right down to its simplest form, you should be using the throttle to control space in front of your vehicle. If you are on the brake all the time when you're following other traffic, you are simply too close and need to increase the following distance between you and other traffic. Uh, my name is Rick August. I'm uh, here at Smart Drive Test. I was a truck driver in the 1990s. Uh, hauling freight between Ontario, Canada, and the United States. Mostly east of the Mississippi, I did make it out to the west. Uh, there are really only three states in the United States in the lower 48 uh, that I haven't been into, Utah, New Mexico, and Nevada. I haven't been into those three states. Every other state I've managed to make it into, whether it's just a little bit, uh, Nebraska, I think I only made it to Omaha. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of cows beyond Omaha. Not many people. There's a lot of cows west of Omaha, Nebraska. All right, uh, 2006, uh, 2000 to 2006, I drove buses for regional Greyhound for Greyhound in Australia while I was going to university there. Uh, became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. Uh, earned my doctorate in legal history uh, in 2006. For those of you you may or may not know, legal history is a study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic, how traffic laws and policing move to uphold the social order. And it's still uh, top of the concerns of how we shore up traffic safety on our roadways with policing. If you wanna know more about me, you can check out the autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website. Good resources to have a look at, defensive driving for new drivers and the real learning begins. You can check out these, uh, the links are down in the description. Have a look at those for more information on keeping yourself safe, particularly in the months and years after getting your license. What is driving? Driving is both a science and an art. Uh, there are specific rules that you need to follow. Follow the speed limit, uh, stay within your lane, drive on the right side of the road. Those are hard rules and scientific rules of keeping yourself safe when you're driving. The art of driving is the psychology of driving. Uh, all kinds of tests and studies have been done on traffic safety, uh, road engineering, uh, automotive engineering, uh, backup sensors, uh, adaptive cruise control. This is the art of driving and it is how you interact with the vehicle and how you interact and drive on our roadways. To drive well, we must have calm awareness. You can't be anxious. I see so many people, they're right up on the steering wheel. They they don't look comfortable. They're completely tense. Uh, you need to relax when you're driving. You need to breathe. You need to have the mantra, I am a safe driver. I am driving well. Uh, bonnet to boot, as I call it. One of the reasons we don't communicate well when we're driving is because we're nose to tail in traffic. Uh, think of it like standing in a grocery store lineup. We don't talk to the person in front of us when we're standing up in a grocery store lineup because we're looking at their backside. It's the same thing in traffic. We're looking at their backside. And I have a kind of a theory about this that if we put communication devices in vehicles, and I mean it's perfectly viable now where we could communicate within 100, 150 feet of our vehicle with drivers around us and talk to them while we're driving. Just uh, have a think about how that would change the, the driving landscape uh, and how it may improve things or how it may make things worse. I think that if we could actually talk to the person in other vehicles that we might actually reduce some of the road rage we see on our roadways. All right, so we have rudimentary, rudimentary communication when we're driving. Uh, it takes a long time to figure out 
the advanced skills of driving and communication, which we were talking about here in the introdu introduction. If people don't have brake lights, if people aren't using signals, how do we know where they're going to go? Okay, uh, scope three, uh, this has gone through several reiterations of what I was gonna call it. <laughs> and I just finally settled on the smarter defensive driving model. Social driving, what many defensive driving models do not define is the problem of defensive driving. What is defensive driving? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? So defensive driving isn't just for you and all the other people on the roadway. It's not this dichotomy between me against the rest of the world kind of thing. It's when, yes, other people make mistakes on the roadway or do something goofy or are aggressive, those types of things. But it's also when you make mistakes on the roadway, you have the habits and skills and abilities in place that are going to keep you safe. Space management, we talked about this, a following distance of three to four seconds. You should be using only the accelerator to control space in front of your vehicle. You should not be using the brake. If you're using the brake to control space between you and the vehicles in front of you, you are following too close. Speed management, understand speed differentials. Understand the average speeds of different kinds of road user groups. For example, pedestrians walking down the roadway, they're traveling at six or seven miles an hour. You are driving your car at 30 miles an hour. So therefore, there is a 23 mile an hour speed differential when you're in the city and you are gonna gain on pedestrians a lot faster. And as I said, you need that minimum one meter space, three feet between you and pedestrians. Uh, communication, we need to communicate effectively. Communication and observation dovetail, they work together because we communicate in case we miss something in the driving environment. And uh, there are studies that have been shown that we make two or three mistakes every mile that we drive. So know that as drivers, that we're gonna make mistakes, we're gonna miss things, we're moving along a roadway. Uh, the ways that we communicate, position of the vehicle on the roadway or the position of the road user, lights and signals, the horn, hand gestures, and eye contact. And then observation, you have to have a forward scanning pattern, check all around the vehicle when you're doing slow speed maneuvers, reversing, looking out through the back window, use all your tools when you're reversing, okay, backup cameras, mirrors, and those types of things. All right, space management, have space around your vehicle. And in this day and age with traffic being as congested as it is in large metropolitan cities and those types of things, always control that space in front. You can't always control a space on four sides of your vehicle, but you can control the space in front of your vehicle. If you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. So space buys you time, time buys you options, and options prevent crashes. Uh, stay back one vehicle length from the vehicle in front of you, and the landmark for that is being able to see the tires of the vehicle in front making clear contact with the road surface. It is a defensive posturing against being rear-ended. You're sitting there, there's no cars behind you, you're looking in the center mirror, you're watching the center mirror, and other cars coming up behind you, and if they're coming up too fast, you can pull ahead or you can move out and around the vehicle in front of you. If the vehicle in front, you know, you change your mind and you need to go somewhere else, you can move out and around the vehicle in front of you, and if it breaks down, uh, the car rolls backwards. I haven't had this happen in a long time, but obviously somebody was learning how to drive a manual transmission here in Vernon a couple of weeks ago and rolled back in front of me. And of course, I had that one vehicle length in front of me, so it wasn't a big deal. But had I been right up on their bumper, they probably ro would have rolled back into me. So this is another reason why you need to stay back that one length. Now, in a utopian world, my magic world that I think of and I dream of, and I, this is the reason why I do YouTube, if everybody stayed back one vehicle length, the whole pack of cars could move off together from the traffic light. But of course, that's that's utopia and that's something that I dream about and is never going to happen. So uh, yeah, but one vehicle length. Okay, on highways and freeways and interstates and motorways, stay back, uh, drive between the clusters of vehicles, stay out of the clusters for whatever reason, Cars want to drive in clusters when they're on highways and freeways. So you can see the pack of cars here on the right. Okay, you want to be over here with these other vehicles because again, I come back to space and managing space around your vehicle. If you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit anything. All right.
always have a buffer of space between you and other road users okay who's driving when you're following too close this is the second reason for traffic crashes following too close the other reason is failing to give up the right of way and then of course we have distracted driving and we have definitions of speeding but speeding is incredibly complicated topic and you can't just say that you're speeding and that driving the posted speed limit is going to keep you safe that is simplistic at at the at the best space management we have predictable actions according to the rules and culture of the roadway it's less likely that you're going to get into trouble because other drivers know what you're doing so you want to be professional and predictable on the roadways reading traffic patterns allows you to predict the individual actions of road users and you also want to have situational awareness looking ahead to controlled intersections figuring out what kind of intersections there are how many turning lanes there are to the left how many slip lanes there are to the right those types of things where are the road users mapping and tracking road users looking for rubberneckers and anything out of the ordinary uh, the other day I was going down a multi-lane road uh, one of the main roads here in town and there were police officers with their lights flashing uh, parked on the side of the road and of course it created chaos in the traffic because everybody's looking rubbernecking trying to figure out what's going on and why they're sitting there and those types of things uh, know the characteristics of vehicles and road users, big trucks. You get at the bottom of the hill and you're in behind a big truck that's loaded, they're going to slow down on the hill. Summertime, you're going to have motor motorcycles, you're going to have trucks with their camper vans, uh, you're going to have RV units and those types of things. In the wintertime, it's going to be snowmobiles. So think about the different times, types of vehicles that are going to be on the roadway at different times of the year. And right now, uh, even with spring kind of peaking over the horizon, uh, I've seen a couple of motorcycles out in the last couple of days and, uh, and thinking to myself, you know, even at five degrees Celsius, uh, which is, you know, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, it's nippy. It's nippy. You want to be very well bundled up on a motorcycle when it's five degrees out. Uh, interpret the road actions of other road users. Look farther down the road. Interpret vehicles moving. Uh, pay attention to your driving. But most of all, maintain that space buffer. We won't even get into zipper merging. Oh, you want to get me excited. There we go. Let's talk about zipper merging. Mapping and tracking at intersections. And the reason why it is critical to locate and to map and track intersections is because more than 40% of crashes happen at intersections. Where are the intersections? Scan the intersections before entering and locate road users and map and track them if they're going to cross your path of travel all right uh, one of the things i noticed when i was in driving in spain uh, a year ago is that pedestrians rarely jaywalk it's not something that they do in europe it's definitely something they do in north america a lot and i know that we do it here in canada a lot so it is part of our culture where people will cross against the light uh, typically called jaywalking. I'm, is that a term that a lot of people are familiar with is jaywalking? Uh, just let me know in the comments if you know what jaywalking is. All right, so good luck on your driver's test and remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. One of the things about defensive driving that is important to keep in mind is, and I've talked about this in previous live streams, I'll talk about it again, uh, in the lifetime of your driving, three or four decades, five decades if you're fortunate uh you are only going to have three or four crashes uh myself my lifetime i touch wood uh, i've had one serious crash when i was a teenager and fortunately i haven't had any crashes since then you know i banged into lots of things with buses and trucks and those types of things but i haven't per se had a crash so i've been very fortunate the problem with the fact that the average driver crashes three or four times in a lifetime every 15 to 17 years is they believe that they are a good driver and not crashing becomes the benchmark of them being a good driver when in fact there are many other factors in the driving environment that could contribute to the fact that you did not have a crash. Not the fact that you're a good driver and you have skills and abilities and techniques that are going to keep you safe. That's not it at all. Know that for the purposes of driving, that we should always be moving forward. We should always try and 
to be a better driver, figure out skills and abilities we can put in place that will keep us safe. That's what we want to do when we're driving. Uh, Ross, and I'm looking forward to spring uh, because next month my birthday is coming up. Awesome. So you're an April baby. That makes you an Aries. <laughs> Evan, my friend, if a vehicle doesn't use singles, how do you know if it uh, will come to a stop or not? Uh, because it's slowing down with speed usually within relation to an intersection or a an entrance to a service or something like that. So this is another thing that we're going to talk about beyond signals, lights, horns. How do we communicate? The other way that we communicate is the position of the vehicle on the ro roadway and its relative position to an intersection or a laneway or those types of things. And as well, uh, position, relative speed, and space management, okay? So where is it in its lane is what I'm talking about. All of these are advanced forms of communication that will tell you what other road users are doing. And it doesn't just apply to cars. It applies to motorcycles, bus, trucks, uh, pedestrians, cyclists, scooters, those types of things. So have a look at all of that. Uh, Evan, if you come across a low clearance sign and can't turn around and go through the underpass, you might want to call the police. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and there are many, many videos here on YouTube and Facebook and other social media platforms with low bridges eating trucks, the top of trucks. They really like the top of trucks because people don't know the height of their vehicle and they don't know the low clearance of bridges, obstructions, and overpasses uh, 13 feet, 6 inches in the United States. If it does, the sign doesn't say 13 feet, 6 inches, don't go under it. It's 4.15 meters here in Canada and other places in the world, okay? Uh, Ross and car crashes can happen to everyone, and yes, they can, and they can be devastating. Even if you are not involved or you walk away unscathed and somebody else dies in the car crash, it is indeed can be devastating. Uh, Mallory, it is March break here in Nova Scotia this week. Uh, Mallory, it is March break here in British Columbia next week and my kids have two weeks off. In British Columbia they get two weeks off because what they've done is they've lengthened, they figured it out somehow over the course of the year. <laughs> they lengthened the school day by 12 minutes every day of the year and the teachers are allowed another week off uh, during March break. I'm actually surprised uh, this year that March break falls on the Easter weekend because usually they're able to get their two weeks of March break and they're also able to, in addition to that, uh, get their four-day Easter weekend. So, <laughs> uh, BC and the Teachers Union, yes, doing well. Uh, and past two years ago and worse I had so far is hitting a bush with my side mirror and that is awesome Ant. glad to hear that. Uh, Skinner's here. Hey Rick, how are you going? I am going fine my friend you. Uh, elevator fan, I had a driver almost hit me one day. I sounded my horn and had to take evasive action. The driver stopped, thank goodness. Yes, and if you honk your horn, that's oftentimes going to alert the other driver that they are doing something goofy and they need to take evasive action or change directions of their vehicle to avoid a collision. And that's often what you want to do. Just a quick beep on the horn is going to alert them uh, that they're doing something that is going to cause two vehicles to collide. Excellent. And Corey's put up the video on where to stop your vehicle in traffic. Excellent. Uh, and how to determine space, Eddie. Some people like to lay on the horn. Yes, they do. Uh, unfortunately, we do have road rage and we need to deal with that. And we can talk about different ways of dealing with road rage. One thing about road rage is do not engage. People can only stay angry for a couple of minutes unless there is input into their anger, something that is going to fuel the fire. So know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that uh, they can only stay mad for a couple of minutes. So if you don't make eye contact, don't unlock your doors, uh, don't roll down your windows, don't vo photograph them, don't video them. You know, you see those goofy people on Twitter who are videoing other people while something there's an altercation and those types of things. Uh, don't don't do that because you will simply make other people angry and that will contribute to the road rage and it will escalate, so don't do that. And as well, don't drive home, okay? Go to a public place, go to some place where there's pedestrians, 
uh, lots of pedestrian traffic, uh, you know, road users, those people that can intervene or keep you safe. Uh, police stations generally are, unless you're in a large metropolitan city, uh, there generally aren't going to be police officers at the station or in the precinct. So better to, uh, you know, go to a public place, uh, someplace else, those types of things. All right. Yes to jaywalking. Okay. So Marion knows what jaywalking is. Uh, elevator fan doesn't know what jaywalking is. Okay. Uh, Mallory, my understanding of jaywalking is when you cross the street with without a crosswalk yes that is true that is exactly what it is if you're crossing the street mid block or you're crossing against the light that is called jaywalking and actually somebody's book here <laughs> it's it's right on my desk uh this guy peter norton i saw this guy in a conference uh fighting traffic um and i was so I hate to say this, but I was so disappointed with this text. I was so looking forward to his book coming out, but it's not well written. Uh, but he said that in the 1920s, when motor cars were beginning to monopolize roadways, that there was a social outreach program that began to humiliate those pedestrians that were walking in the roadway and holding up traffic. And... You have to understand that before the motor car came out and horses, when horses monopolized our roadways, uh, horses only walk at five or six miles an hour. Contrary to what you see in Hollywood films, horses don't gallop for hours on end. <laughs> horses only gallop for 20 minutes and then they're done. And then they're like, ah, yeah, where's the barn? I'm going to the barn. Okay. And if you want a horse to work eight hours a day, they walk at six miles an hour. So before the motor car came along, you had horses on the roadway and people on the roadways and it was a social space. Everybody lived in the roadway and it was not unusual before the beginning of the 20th century that you had a house and the front stoop of the house was right on the roadway because you just walked out of your house onto the roadway because the roadway was a social space. You could hear a horse coming and you walked the same speed as a horse. <laughs> so. Uh, what happened in the 1920s, according to Peter Norton, was that there was this social media outreach program that began to humiliate the pedestrian and began to move people off the roadways. And it was no longer a social space because the motor car monopolized the roadway. And one of the ways that they did this was with the term jaywalker. And it was a term that, that according to Peter Norton, came out of Kansas and a J was a dim-witted, dull person, right? Not very smart. Uh, and they called him a J. So if you were J walking, you were not a smart person. You were not very, <laughs> you know, but they're trying to overturn and completely transition hundreds and hundreds of maybe even centuries of people thinking that roadways are public space and now they're trying you know they're becoming monopolized by motor cars and what was happening in the 1920s uh you had huge numbers of pedestrian collisions where uh motor cars were running over pedestrians right in the roadways and this is why they were trying to uh move pedestrians off roadways because it was so dangerous for them with with motor cars uh, Marion, who gets me is when the pedestrian looks, sees you coming and still keeps walking and just steps out in front of you. Yeah, that happens too. Uh, a lot of pedestrians, and this is an interesting point, is, is that they think they're invincible. They really do. And I, I have, one of the things that parents need to do is they need, one of the things we teach our children is we teach our children road sense because it's not, it's not a, an ethical lesson that we teach them right it's not like you know violence and murder and stealing i mean those are all ethical decisions that we teach our children from you know when they're very very little and then <laughs> and then but you know road sense that's something we teach them much later when they're five or six or seven years old and they're out walking around on the roadways and those types of things and we try and teach them about this danger of motor cars but pedestrians and I would argue that, you know, 25% of traffic fatalities are pedestrians globally. If you look at it globally, 25% of fatalities are pedestrians. And it's because they don't have that ethical response to the dangers of traffic. They, it's, it's something that is taught much later in life, this, this road sense 
of children so they don't see the danger until they get hit and then of course they become an advocate of traffic safety and never do it again and it's you know it's again it's another thing that hollywood <laughs> has completely misrepresented in the fact that you know you can get hit by a car and you just get up and you just walk away as if nothing happened and that is not that is couldn't nothing could be farther uh from the truth in terms of getting hit by a car by a pedestrian i mean your pelvis and your knees are completely shattered and you probably never walk right ever again even if you do convalesce if you do convalesce uh jackson hello my friend uh, i need to work on braking sooner especially on intersections yes indeed awesome uh eddie i cringe when i see people walking around when it's dark out with no reflective uh belts vests yes wearing dark clothes yes and uh the other thing i can't remember the statistics uh i was reading this the other day that most pedestrian fatalities happen after dark and exactly that they you know they're not paying attention uh, who knows what state of <laughs> clarity they're in whether they're inebriated they've been smoking marijuana they've been drinking or those types of things uh dark i have worked uh with a number of people when i worked at the hospital doing driver rehabilitation who had been hit struck by cars at night you know walking on the shoulders of roads walking your roads and those types of things and you know don't do it don't do it be very careful when you're walking uh you know the other one that gets me here in western canada uh it's not an Ontario thing. I'd never had seen it in Ontario. And there were people who will argue up and down with me that they are right uh, riding a bicycle into traffic in a bicycle lane. Uh, I just, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> um, you know, because there's a curb there and I can't get over. If the car is doing something goofy, I can't get over. And so if I get hit by a car when I'm drop riding into traffic, as an example of people who do this there now you have the combined speed so the car's doing 30 i'm so we'll do it in kilometers per, uh miles per hour so the car's doing 30 miles an hour i'm doing 18 miles an hour so now it's 48 miles an hour of the combined force of the collision right as opposed to if if i'm riding at with traffic and the car's doing 30 miles an hour, it's only a 30 mile an hour crash, and I'm probably gonna survive because I'm probably only gonna, gonna get sideswiped as opposed to riding into traffic. Uh, it's gonna be a head-on collision. I'm probably not gonna survive as the cyclist. And let me tell you, I know because I've been hit on my bicycle a few times. Uh, I got hit by a bus, and I was riding in the same direction as the bus, and the bus hit me on the shoulder. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and I ran into another cyclist head-on I was coming across this bridge and there was like a sidewalk on this one side and you come across the bridge and on the other side of the bridge there was a hill that went up and I got just about off the bridge and I look up and this guy is coming down the mountain bike path on this thing and he is hauling like he is like no brakes and I just kind of saw him coming and I just kind of turned my body like this as I went up. I think he got the worst of it because I got my shoulder up underneath his chin but you know, I cut my hands as the two bicycles came together, my hands all bleeding and whatnot. But, uh, you know, it, it was like, oh my God, where's this guy coming from? And I mean, this is the other piece about it. Uh, and there's a lot to, you know, a lot of transferable skills. So moving furniture, when you go through doorways and you've got a piece of furniture, you're both holding the sofa on either end, there's two of you. When you go through the doorways, you go really slow. It's the same thing on a bicycle. When you're coming down a hill onto a narrow bridge, you go slow because you gotta facilitate that transition. It's the same thing if you're coming off the roadway and you're gonna go into your garage, you're going from a big space into a very narrow space, you're gonna go slower. If you're going into a parking garage, you're gonna go slower. If you're going into an intersection, you're gonna go slower. If you're on a roadway where there's vehicles parked on both sides of the road, you're gonna go slower because now you have confined space, limited space. So you, from a defensive driving point of view, the less space you have, the slower you're gonna go. And it's the same thing from a defensive driving point of view when you have your space your minimum safe distance between you and another road user that is beginning to get closer and closer together you to a pedestrian then you need to go slower and slower so that you can control that space with your speed 
that's what you need to do. Uh, Clouds, just a side note, jaywalking, you will see this type of pedestrians a lot in bigger cities in Nuremberg and in Bavarian, so they do jaywalk in Germany then, okay? Uh, Ross and I have not been stopped by a train for a while, but when it comes to railroad crossing signals when I'm approaching them, I do keep an eye on them just in case they start to activate and I scan them. Yes, and uh, I don't know whether you saw that. I don't know how recent it was. It's hard to tell with the feed on Twitter because people just post stuff <laughs> and then you actually look into it and you find that it was a few years ago. It is not recent. So the Amazon driver who was hit by the train and basically cut the van in half and he's sitting in the front <laughs> and he actually lived. He was actually saying he didn't hear the train because one He's deaf in one ear. Now, if you're deaf in one ear and you're coming up to a railway crossing and you know you can't hear, wouldn't you stop, roll down both windows and like check and double check before you just drive over the railway crossing? Because the reason that trains are dangerous is because they don't keep schedules. Yes, passenger trains do run on schedules but do you know that schedule i mean other outside of taxi drivers do you know that schedule taxi drivers do know the schedule right but freight trains don't keep schedules that's why they're dangerous epic uh, speaking of bike lanes there are still incidents of vehicles hitting onto the protected bike lane i wonder what uh is the tip on how to prevent an accident with a protected bike lane maybe go 20 uh i don't know epic what the solution is to that issue uh you know when i was riding my bicycle in melbourne on a daily basis they had bicycle lanes and the traffic would back up in the morning when it was congested and people would nose into the bicycle lane so the front corner of their vehicle would be in the bicycle lane and you know i i'm not a very good i i lose my temper a lot <laughs> and most of the road rage incidents i've had on my bicycle and you know, I just like would ride by and I would bang on the hood of the car and I'd be like, what are you doing in the bicycle lane? It, there is a bicycle lane here for a reason. And, the, you know, unless it is raised with a curb and concrete, people, uh, drivers are going to take up that space. They're going to use that space. They're not going to see that as separate space. They're going to drive in it for whatever reason. Uh, elevator, I saw a cop pull over a driver today. Uh, yeah, that happens a lot. Uh, that's their job. Okay, uh, Marion, what do you mean riding into traffic as in going against traffic? Yes, Marion, that's exactly what I mean. So the traffic's coming this way. Traffic's going this way, and the bicycle's riding this way with the traffic going this way. And I, it's, it's common here in Vernon. It's common in Kelowna, uh, in the Okanagan Valley here. Uh, and it's I've never seen it before. I... <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me i've been all over the world and it's this is the only place and you know my friend upstairs he's like yes i ride into traffic when i, I ride a bicycle not that he's ever going to ride a bicycle ever again but that's he, he had an argument with me one night that it was much safer to ride into traffic and i was like no 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 and I've been, I've been, I'm an avid cyclist. I mean, I've done bicycle tours in Tasmania, Scotland, Cape Breton Island, Newfoundland. I would never ride into traffic. I just not safe. Uh, Carrie, should we be driving a bit slower than speed limit at night since the darkness makes for less than ideal conditions? Yes. If you're driving on a back road, then probably carry yes. But if you're driving on main highways and those types of things, they're generally well lit. Lots of lighting at intersections and those types of things. Lots of traffic to be able to help you out, to be able to navigate down the roadway and those types of things. Uh, if you're not comfortable with it, you know, and obviously newer vehicles have much better lights on them. Of course, you know, they burn the retinas out of your eyes if you're driving into them and they don't lower their high beams for sure. So, yeah. Uh, Curry, uh, all over the U.S., we do that. It's practical. Uh what's practical curry okay uh we have a bike lane here in port moody they have a concrete barrier that separates the bike lane from the normal lane they also have those yellow poles stuck into the concrete barriers yes and you know if they're physically separated if the bike lane is physically separated not just a line on the roadways as you said with raised curbs uh concrete barriers those types of things then yes people will use them and i was in holland and it's the same thing 
all of the bike lanes are separate from the roadway and when they're separate from the roadway people are going to use them also the other piece about bicycle lanes is they have to be flat okay people will not ride a bicycle unless it's flat and this is the other reason why holland has a very high bicycle usage because it's flat and you know the number of people i've been in bicycle shops here and people say to me oh i you know i'm getting an electric bike because they don't want to ride up the hills that's the fun part you ride up the hill you get this great view and then you bomb down the other side that's the fun part i mean if you're not yeah it's just if you're not riding up if you're not doing what you need to do to get to the top and riding the bicycle no <laughs> no uh, you want to see the car coming towards you on a bike instead of a car on your behind. No, Curry. No, no. Disagree. Completely disagree. And I am an avid cyclist, so no. Uh, I can hear the cars coming. Uh, if you're wearing headphones and those types of things, you're completely irresponsible riding a bicycle because you should not wear headphones because uh, the sound is so important when you're riding a bicycle to hear vehicles coming and you can manage your space and traffic and those types of things i i just cannot i cannot endorse that it's not safe at all elevator are bikes required to stop at all red lights and stop signs yes they are elevator fan they are considered a vehicle on the roadway and are required to uh obey all traffic laws uh when riding on, on roadways uh, Ross and I do drive almost on a daily basis to take my brother to work and it does help me to get full experience. Yes, it does for sure. So we want to talk about space management, smarter defensive driving, social driving. Okay, if you do what other people are doing on the roadway, you are not a safer, smarter driver because other people on the roadway are engaging in social driving. They're speeding, not coming to complete stops at stop signed intersections. They're following too close. They're stopping too close in traffic they're doing and executing maneuvers and techniques and skills that eventually are going to get them into trouble when they're driving and as i said many people are duped by the fact that we only you know in a lifetime of driving 30 40 50 years however long that is on average most vehicles only crash once every 15 to 17 years so you're not going to have a crash very often now in the 20th century and if you don't think traffic problem, traffic crashes are a problem, in the 20th century, from 1900 to 2000, more people died and were injured in car crashes than soldiers sent to war. So all the wars in the 20th century, the First World War, Japanese-Russo War, that was 1904. Uh, yeah, we had a couple, no, the, that was, I was thinking of the Boer War, but that was 1898, Okay. So moving forward from the Japanese Russo War, the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, uh, Middle East, Vietnam, more people die than soldiers sent to battle in the 20th century uh, in car crashes. So know that. So it's a problem. If we took all the car crashes in the United States of America, 45,000 traffic deaths, uh, there's one car crash every 60 seconds in the United States. We took all the car crashes in the United States, put them in one place at one time, it would be considered a national emergency. So it's a problem, okay? Traffic crashes are a problem. Traffic injuries, traffic deaths are a problem within our society. And of course, we're seeing all kinds of things going on right now with lowering speed limits in residential areas to try and combat this and distract the driving. Uh, you know, cell phones and cars and telematics and those types of things. It is a problem. What do we need to do about it? So, this is part of social driving, being distracted while you're driving. And we are never going to eliminate distracted driving unless we have some mechanism in a car that disables our phone and disables all of the telematics in the vehicle we are not going to eliminate distracted driving. We, we need to take the cup holders out as well and we need to get rid of all the fast food joints uh, so we couldn't eat in cars and we couldn't drink and all those types of things. We are distracted when we're driving, okay? There's just too many things going on. We are comfy, comfy in our brand new automobile and there's a lot of things going on and we don't feel at risk when we're driving, okay? And cars just get better and better and better. And here's an example of that. My old buggy, the 1998 Honda CRV that I have is 26 years old, okay? I do 140, which is 80 miles an hour in the buggy. And I know I'm going 140 because, you know, you can hear the wind whistling 
<laughs> and <laughs> the old buggy's like, I can do it. I can do it. And, you know, whereas Tracy's Audi S4 has a V6 supercharger and you do 140 in that thing and you're just like, woo -doo 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 -doo, going down the road, right? And just about any car, I was talking to my friend the other day, bought a brand new 2024 uh, RAV4. Well, it's got a four-cylinder turbo in it. A four-cylinder turbo puts out 190 horsepower. Four-cylinder turbo puts 190 horsepower. Well, what is that? I mean, you could do 140, 150 kilometers an hour, which is 80, 90 mile an hour in that thing and all day long. So you're not used to the, sp the speed that that vehicle is traveling. So it becomes even more important when you're driving to manage that space around your vehicle. Stay out of the clusters on the highway. Have that three-second following distance when you're driving in town using the accelerator to control space in front of your vehicle, all right? Stopping in traffic so you're one vehicle length back. And people say, oh, if I do that, I'll never get anywhere. Other people will cut in front of me. Yes, the odd time people will cut in front of you, but not very often. And I'm an aggressive driver, okay? But I never compromise that space in front of my vehicle. Never, ever compromise that space in front of my vehicle. I always have that buffer space in front of my vehicle to keep myself safe when I'm driving. Because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit anything. Space buys you time, time buys you options, options prevent crashes, all right? Carrie, you were right almost every day. The traffic port here in Twin Cities talks about traffic crashes. Yes, lots and lots. In the United States, the statistic I was reading the other day, every 60 seconds, every minute in the United States of America, there is a traffic crash. Uh, Eddie, for the goodness sakes, use your turn signals, people. Yes, yes, and that's the other part of social driving is that other people do not use their turn signals. They do not communicate effectively. Marion, I disabled my phone. I turned my phone off. Yes, excellent. Uh, elevator, when you are turning, always turn into the closest lane you're going. Yes, right lane to right lane, left lane to left lane. And this is part and parcel of you being predictable on the roadway. You're going to risk being involved in a sideswipe crash if you're turning onto a multi-lane roadway and you automatically drift over into the far lane, okay? So right lane to right lane, left lane to left lane. Uh, Epic I am seeing with social driving is that there is a left turn lane with painted uh, yellow stripes. They would simply drive onto it then make the left turn. I've done it before with instructors, don't do it. Uh, yes, on the painted islands. Yes, don't drive on the painted islands because they're there for your safety, there for your protection to create a buffer of space <laughs> between you moving left and the vehicles on the other side of the roadway so that you don't bang into each other. It's trying to demarcate that space uh, between the opposing lanes of traffic and that's why they have painted islands. But again, Driving over painted islands is part and parcel of social driving. And this is what I talk about in terms of defensive driving. Defensive driving is not just to compensate for the errors and mistakes of other people on the roadway. It's also there for when you make mistakes, when you shouldn't be driving because you're too emotional, because your cat died or a relative died or those types of things, or you got into a fight with your spouse. It's also for when you make mistakes and you're driving when you shouldn't be, okay? So know that that skills, abilities, and techniques. And as I say again and again and again, shoulder checking, for example, do not lose the skill of shoulder checking. It may not save you today, tomorrow, next week, next year, but in five years, it may save your proverbial bacon of running over that pedestrian that stepped off the curb between you and the vehicle. So know that. Uh, Eddie, and please don't wait until the last possible second to let the driver behind you know that you want to turn. Yes, if you can have six to ten flashes on your turn signal that is ideal all right three minimum and the reason i say three minimum on the flashes is the first one gets their attention the second one allows the other person road user driver to locate your vehicle and the third one allows them to take some sort of action and if you're just learning how to drive and lane changing and you say oh i put my signal on and the person sped up and took all the space now, the person was actually doing you a favor because they got out of the way when you put your signal on and created some space for you to move into and change lanes. All right. Other people, most of the time, 95% of the time, other people are going to help you out when you're driving. Okay. If you ask nicely, 
but there's this reluctance for us to ask. <laughs> I don't know what psychological thing is going on in our brain that we are reluctant to ask. It's like we got to do it on the sly. It's like, oh, I, I got to sneak around there on the right turn. I'm not going to signal because they know I'm going there anyway, so I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> Better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission, right? <laughs> so signals. Signals are to tell others that you wish to move over, not that you are moving over, okay? <laughs> Twitter or X, it's Twitter. It's Twitter, it's Twitterly, the social uh, social plat media platform. The social media platform formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Prince, the artist formerly known as Prince. The social media platform formerly known as Twitter. Uh, Mallory, safe driving is key when you drive successfully. Yes, indeed. Excellent. Uh, Klaus, some bike riders thinking they can just switch the physics to do something else. Safety first, yes. And of course, any city that you have uh, bicycle couriers in, uh, that's another one. Yeah, that'll really raise your ire and make you wonder what they're doing. Uh, Christina, uh, everybody else, but okay. Um, confused since I started driving in Calgary. By left lane is a passing lane according to Alberta Manual, but when on the highway, the majority sits in the left lane and just goes a bit faster everybody else but they don't really move over and they don't uh, keep uh, lane free is that just what people do here and what am I supposed to do uh, Christina those are called left lane squatters and that is very much part and parcel of social driving unfortunately it is the reality of driving in Calgary I've been to Calgary and that's what they do <laughs> they 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 left lane squat they sit in the left lane uh, retired I'm a defensive driver awesome that's great. Retired. Uh, Marion, everyone has forgotten how to use their signals. It bugs me. Uh, <laughs> retired says, I don't drive in snow or heavy rain. Awesome. Marion, they haven't forgotten how to use their signal, Marion. They're simply not using them because it increases the resale value of their vehicle if the signals aren't used. That's, the, that's what's going on there behind all of that. Uh, Eddie, I've seen an increase of vehicles with new drivers. Please be patient. And similar bumper stickers, people trying to curb road rage. Unfortunately, Eddie, those signs don't work. It's like having your uh, driving school car logoed up. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It does not prevent uh, road rage and people calling in and telling you that you, you know, you're number one and those types of things. It doesn't work. Uh, elevator fan, my mom often turns into the far when turning. Uh, yep, that's, don't like to hear that. Uh, Corey's put up a couple of videos here, how to mirror signal shoulder check when driving, how to manage space around your vehicle. Awesome, thank you for that, Corey, that's awesome. Uh, Corey, I did get your text, I'll respond to it here for you. I don't see that as a problem. Left lane squatters in Vancouver. Anywhere in North America, we have left lane squatters. It te seems to be part and parcel of the driving culture in North America. Again, uh, Klaus can probably talk to Germany, the culture, the driving culture there in Germany. The driving culture in Spain, uh, people did not sit in the left lane when I was driving in Spain. There were less and fewer uh, left lane squatters. Uh, yeah, now you, have a, <laughs> now you have a name for them. And the challenge is, Christina, is trying to get by them. Okay, trying to get out and around them and get past them because oftentimes, as you said, they're only going a little bit more than the traffic flow. They're not, nobody's getting over to clear that lane so that we can use it as a passing lane. And it is incredibly uh, frustrating when that happens. Uh, yeah, so left lane squatters. So space, social driving, speed management, speed differentials. You want to understand, understand speed differentials. Uh, this is one of the arguments. Uh, that truck drivers are using against uh, speed limiters on their truck, that speed limiters are incredibly dangerous. And what speed limiters are on commercial vehicles, they're limited to 62, 65 miles an hour. And uh, it's interesting that truck drivers, some truck drivers, are getting very upset about it and are opposed to it. Companies have been regulating speed on big trucks since the 1990s every truck that i drove in the 1990s was speed regulated and the reason is fuel economy it, it has nothing to do with safety it has to do with fuel economy of course the ontario government implemented a speed regulation on trucks uh some years ago 
and it was all about you know put forward as safety and those types of things it's it's fuel economy because you have to understand that big trucks unlike your car which gets 20 30 maybe 40 maybe even 50 miles to the gallon a big truck gets six to seven miles to the gallon even in this day and age they get six to seven miles to the gallon and so you don't want them running 110 uh, you know, 130, 140, you don't want them running 60, 70, 80 miles an hour because then the fuel mileage just goes <laughs> when they already get horrible fuel mileage. And, uh, you know, everybody's talking about inflation. It wasn't inflation. It was the fact that they put the price of diesel fuel up to $2 a liter, uh, which is about six six fifty a gallon in the United States. Yeah. When fuel diesel fuel is two dollars a liter the cost of everything is going to increase so that's where inflation started uh eddie laws may differ in regard to vehicles do uh vehicle lighting during low visibility hours check your individual states yes check your individual states for sure uh retired who do not drive on road trips from 11 p.m to 5 a.m and that is prudent retired because it is showing that this is those are the times that you're going to fall asleep because we have two dips in our circadian rhythms right it's kind of in the mid-afternoon from kind of two to four in the afternoon and then again that one three to five in the in the morning right so know that <laughs> yeah yeah marion it's it's an interesting conundrum and uh even when i went back in 2016 and you know you go and fill the truck up at the pump and it's twelve hundred dollars twelve hundred dollars to fill the truck up yeah because it's 300 gallon tanks and it's 1200 bucks to fill up the truck. Uh, Mallory, turn signals, they're just there to tell people what do you want to do on the other roadway. I can't stand it when people do not use their turn signals. And yes, that is what happens. Uh, Corey says, it's a strange feeling when you end up passing someone on the right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're passing on the right. And it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. Can you just get out of the left lane, please? You know, or it's when they do that and I pass them on the inside with in the buggy, it's like, really, could you get out of the left lane? And uh, I may have told you this. I dated this woman briefly years ago. <laughs> and we're driving on the highway and she's in the left lane and she is left lane squatting, right? And, you know, the relationship was already a little bit tense. And somebody passed her on the right and they pulled back in front of her and then they pointed and she lost her cool. And she's like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> and of course, she's like, and what do you think? And this is what I said. If you're going to become a driving instructor, or you have any thoughts of being a driving instructor, unless you are being paid, do not say anything. OK, don't say anything unless you're being paid. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, they're they're kind of right. And oh, that was the end of it. And then the fight was on. Then the fight. <laughs> So, and so yeah, uh, we didn't have any dates after that. So yeah, uh, remember that if you're going to become a driving instructor, unless you are being paid, be quiet when you're in other people's cars and they're driving. Unless you want to have a fight, <laughs> don't say anything as a driving instructor because there is no more emotional topic than commenting on somebody's driving epic here in the northwest where there are states there are mostly six or more lanes left lane squatters tend to be from states that are mostly four lane highways like pennsylvania and new york all right so now left lane squatting is a regional thing it depends what state you're from <laughs> uh eddie some habits can be very difficult to break i'm guilty of social driving caught my uh myself several times and had to calm down and remember the serenity prayer yes that happens uh yeah i have that every now and again uh, I had that a few years ago. I was coming back from Victoria and I don't know whether I was tired or not. And I was tailgating this other car and I don't know what happened. It ended up into some sort of almost road rage. And then, uh, you know, I wasn't too far away, but he, the other vehicle brake checked me and I was like, what am I doing? It was just like, had this moment where it's like, what am I doing? So again, it comes back to defensive driving right that it's not just about you putting in places techniques and abilities and strategies to keep yourself safe but when you make mistakes right and i was like what am i what am i doing like what am i what am i risking here so yeah you gotta you gotta think about what you're doing when you're driving and sometimes you need to calm down or get a hold of yourself emotionally so that you can keep yourself safe on the roadways because it just takes one moment 
to change the rest of your life in terms of a car crash. Uh, retired, too many people in the USA are driving on the roads and looking at their cell phones, and yes, they are. Uh, retired cell phones are just one of the many things, uh, you know, the telematics in the car, that big screen in the middle now, eating, drinking, <laughs> you know, trying to deal with the dog, trying to deal with the kids in the back seat. There's all kinds of crazy things uh, that they're doing when they're driving. Uh, Mary, my father used to say, stop backseat driving. Yes, <laughs> there is that for sure. Uh, Big Mac said, my brother is a crazy driver, but I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Yes. See, see, Sam knows the same thing that I know. Unless you're being paid as a driving instructor, be very careful what you say when you're when other people are driving in the car. You, <laughs> the, the fight will start. And uh, you know, funny about this, I think I've mentioned my friend David some years ago. Uh, nicest guy you ever met. You know, one on one, sitting having a coffee, those types of things. But get this person in the car, and it was this Jekyll and Hyde thing. It was the you know Motor Mania, the Disney uh, animation from the 1950s, Mr. Walker and Mr. Wheeler, and he would just get in the car and become completely psycho, banging on the steering wheel, tailgating, speeding, telling other people they were number one. It was just I was just like crazy. Who is this person? And, and, and Tracy's a little bit like that. We got to Calgary. She's from Calgary, right? We get there. And I'm coming up, you know, I'm, I'm on, I guess, uh, trails, Shaganappy Trail, which I think is absolutely hilariously funny. Uh, Shaganappy Trail and, you know, Northwest and all those types of things in Calgary. And, you know, it's all freeways all around Calgary. And, you know, I slowed down because somebody was merging onto the, under the highway and she's like don't let them in <laughs> i was like what what the heck <laughs> yeah crazy uh carrie yes driving down the freeway i saw the driver behind me texting on the phone while driving yes in the rearview mirror driving talking on their phones those kinds of things klaus uh left lane squatters driving on the autobahn in germany uh klaus yeah and i don't understand it uh tracy's in Germany right now and she was driving from Hamburg to Dusseldorf on the Autobahn and she's like yeah you you don't want to be sitting out there in the left lane because some of these some of these people are doing like 250 300 kilometers an hour she says you will get run over on the Autobahn uh, outdoor fishing someone break checked me in the school zone recently and on an incline and saw the line I got the footage all recorded on my dash cam Rid ridiculous driver yeah and it's unfortunate when people do that because it is incredibly dangerous and there were many years ago when I was driving truck I saw a car do that to a tractor trailer on the highway at like 110 kilometers an hour yeah don't you know don't brake check other people uh, it's just crazy uh, Big Mac Sam hello my friend how are you awesome uh, we're at the end <laughs> so if you had a driver's test in the last couple of weeks and you were successful congratulations that is awesome news and if you have a test coming up Good luck on that. If you have any questions, uh, drop us a comment down in the comment section there. More than happy to help you out. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.